welcome to the Bristow's webinar. It's Robert Bond, partner here in London, uh, and I'm joined by Felipe and Naoki, who I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, the topic today is a comparison of GDPR, very briefly, uh, with the law in Japan uh, and the law in Brazil. Um, the webinar is going to be recorded. It will be available together with the PowerPoint slides from our website next week. Do by all means send questions in using the question box as we go uh, through today. And apart from myself doing a few slides at the beginning, I'm then going to be handing over to Felipe. Uh, he's a Brazilian trained lawyer and a partner at Palhares Abogados in Sao Paulo and specializes in privacy and data protection matters. Uh, Felipe is a fellow of information privacy and holds several certifications from the IAPP. He has an LLM degree from New York University and is admitted to practice both in Brazil and in New York. And after Felipe finishes, then he hands over to Naoki. Naoki is a partner and head of the London office of the Tokyo Full Service Law, for, law Firm at Sumi and Sakai, which is the only independent Japanese law firm with London and Frankfurt offices. And he's been advising uh, UK and European clients looking to enter the Japanese market or who have issues there. And he has extensive experience in the fields of e-commerce, fintech and data protection. So, um, why are we looking at, this time, Brazil and Japan? For those of you who've attended webinars in the past, you'll know that we've looked, uh, for example, at Russia and South Africa. And we've talked about um, the law in California. And data protection laws now seem to be like waiting for a London red bus. You wait for ages and then they all come at once. So having had GDPR, then suddenly we get the Consumer uh, Act in California. We've got the state of Washington that has drafted law. Uh, Kenya, Bahrain, uh, Singapore updating their law. Malaysia a few years ago doing their law. Uh, we've seen new laws coming through in South America. Uh, and so it goes on. And one of the things that I find as a lawyer advising multinationals is that quite often I'm asked, uh, how would this issue be interpreted under the data protection law of Algeria or of Dubai or of, oh, I don't know, Taiwan? Uh, and the answer is I found generalizing is to think about history, think about commonwealth, colonization, and conquest. It's not surprising that the British former commonwealth or current commonwealth countries have a UK approach. So Singapore, South Africa, Canada, India, Australia, as examples, have very English style law. Spain and Portugal, uh, heavily influence Argentina, Uruguay, Brazil, and I get Macau. Um, France influences North Africa, uh, Vietnam and Canada. And uh, again, we've seen with some of the uh, early laws in Europe that Germany influenced Hungary and so on and so forth. So it's not 100% correct as a rule of thumb, but I think that's fair to say that we are seeing, perhaps apart from the US, which is being a very, has done a very um, different approach, uh, we see history impacting on how data laws have been created. Uh, GDPR, uh, I don't intend to do any more than to leave you to look at this slide and just remind ourselves, because this dovetails into what both Felipe and Naoki are going to say, is that GDPR, as we know, widened the definition of personal data, extended its application to not only controllers, but now processors, created a definite extraterritorial approach, 
focused much more on the lawful grounds for processing than perhaps we had seen under the old directive. Being a regulation was of course intended to produce a one-stop shop so that we would not have 28 member states interpreting in 28 different ways. I think that's failed. I think we're all um, realizing that there were sufficient derogations left in the regulation that we do see slightly different approaches in each member state. The role of the DPO uh, has been something much newer than we had had before, not something that was mandatory and we are still exploring how you practically perform as a DPO. The key words of transparency and accountability came into the principles of GDPR and interestingly every client and every business wants certainty about how to approach a compliance issue and of course GDPR does not give you certainty it expects you to be accountable for your own decisions and your own policies and that's a good thing and in part that's a challenge the areas of privacy by default or privacy by design and data protection impact assessments uh, again were a relatively new concept and are now enshrined in GDPR and of course the uh, increased regulatory fines and the enforcements and so on have really raised the game and at long last uh, put compliance with data protection uh, up to the executive level and very much a c-suite issue so those are the key takeaways from gdpr uh, and without further ado i'm going to hand over to felipe to take us through what's happening in Brazil and maybe cross-reference some of those GDPR issues. Felipe. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining and thank you, Robert, for having me. Uh, I'll try to give you a, a few overview of what's happening in Brazil, actually, where we were, where we are right now, and where we are probably heading uh, in the next future. So privacy is not actually something new in Brazil. We had some laws prior to this one that already had some privacy provisions. Uh, even the Brazilian constitution says that privacy and the right to intimacy are fundamental rights. Uh, and right now, Congress in Brazil is actually discussing to amend the constitution to include also uh, the right to data protection and, and protection of personal data as another fundamental right established by the Constitution of Brazil. Uh, we also have some provisions related to privacy and data protection in the Consumer Defense Code, uh, in the Freedom of Information Act, and specifically in the Civil Rights Framework for the Internet. So as you might be able to see, we had some sectoral approach to privacy as the one that the US uh, still has. Uh, and right now, last year, in August of 2018, uh, we enacted what is called the New Brazilian General Data Protection Law, uh, the LGPD, which is the acronym we use in Brazil right now. And the law will come in force either in February of 2020 or in August. And I'm saying this because uh, right now we are discussing in Brazil, we have in Brazil what is called a provisional measure in Brazil. It is similar to what you have in the US called an executive order. So because of that, the president at the end of last year issued a provisional measure that amended the Brazilian data protection law and changed some of its provisions, including uh, its effect date. So prior to the executive order, the law would be enacted 18, actually enacted not, but in effect, 18 months after the date it was enacted, and this would be February of 2020. Uh, after the executive order, which is being discussed in Congress right now, the effective date was changed from 18 months to 24 months, and because of that, uh, the law will probably be in effect in August of next year. Different from what happens in the US, an executive order in Brazil must be discussed by Congress and must be approved by Congress within a deadline. And if it's not, it becomes new and void. Uh, it's funny that actually today, Congress is expected to take a vote, at least the House of Congress is expected to take a vote 
on this provisional measure. So we might have some news at the end of the day in Brazil. Now it's noon in Brazil, so later we might have some actually news regarding the provisional measure. Uh, it has to be either approved by Congress until June, June 3rd, uh, which is less than 10 days away, and Congress actually has to vote and approve it by the House and by the Senate, otherwise it becomes new and void. And again, if that happens, we'll actually go back to having an effective date of February 2020. Those are some of the fundamentals of the LGPD. As you might see, we have like uh, great fundamentals of respecting privacy and information self-determination. But at the same time, we have other fundamentals that are related to the free initiative and free competition. So in a way, the Bra Brazilian legislator uh, try to actually accommodate and, and, and make a compromise to make sure that uh, we want to respect privacy and data protection, but at the same time, this is not to prevent uh, economic development and new technologies from coming. Uh, and this is really interesting. Uh, regarding the territorial scope of the law, just like the GDPR, we have an extraterritorial scope. And because of that, you have to comply with the law uh, it's important to probably to say that the law applies both to online and offline processing and to the processing of personal data. Those concepts are the same processing personal data, controller and processor. Uh, those concepts are the same under the Brazilian law as under the GDPR. Uh, and because of that, you have to comply with the law regarding to its territorial scope when the processing of personal data is performed in Brazil, uh, when the processing is related to the offering of goods or services to data subjects in Brazil and when the data was collected in Brazil. So it doesn't matter if the data is from a Brazilian national or from anyone else. It is, if it is from a data subject that was in Brazil and the data was collected in Brazil or if it was related to offering goods or services to data subjects in Brazil, you have to comply with the law. Those are some exceptions to the material scope of the law. So you actually don't need to comply with the law when the processing is performed by an individual exclusively for personal and non-economic purposes. Uh, this is kind of the same of the household exception that you have under the GDPR, but at the same time it's a little bit wider because it's not only a household. If you think that personal and non-economic purposes might be a wider range of things, uh, we would probably not have a discussion regarding CCTVs because in a sense, when you say that you are collecting data for purely personal and non-economic purposes, you probably would be able to do that even if when you have a CCTV on your house, you are recording a little bit of the, of the street as well. Uh, a second exception, when the processing is performed exclusively for journalistic, artistic or academic purposes, or when processing is performed exclusively for public safety, national defense, uh, state safety or activities of investigation or persecution of criminal offenses, uh, similar with what you have under GDPR, although we do not have a specific legislation just to treat legal, legal enforcement processing activities. And then you have a fourth one, which is when uh, the data is originated from outside of Brazil and is not shared with Brazilian controllers or processors, or any uh, international transfer to another country other than the originating one, provided that the originated one has the same level of data protection laws or it's at least considered an adequate jurisdiction. Regarding the principles of the LGPD, as you might notice as well, we have actually the same principles that you have under GDPR. We just split them into 10. So you have six, uh, if you count with the accountability, one, seven under GDPR. We have almost the same one. So you have purpose limitation, uh, adequacy, data minimization, free access to data subject. The data needs to be <coughs> accurate, updated. Uh, it needs to be transparent. All of the processing activities need to be transparent. Uh, you need to employ safeguards and technical and and administrative measures to make sure that the data is safe and to prevent any damages to data subjects. Uh, and we actually have one, an additional one uh, in Brazilian law, which is the non-discrimination one. So you cannot process data, personal data at least in Brazil, uh, if you have any kind of illicit or abusive discriminatory purposes. 
now. Regarding the legal basis, we also have some legal bases that are really similar under the GDPR, although we have a wider range of legal bases. This is for regular uh, personal data, not uh, sensitive or special category as personal data. So we have 10, you, you have six under GDPR, we have 10, but we also have consent, uh, compliance with legal or regulatory obligation, the execution of public policies, if you have to fulfill a contract or even preliminary procedures uh, upon the request of the data subject, you can also process data when you have to exercise rights, either in judicial, administrative, or arbitration procedures, when you need to protect the life or physical well-being of the, of the data subject or a third party, uh, which is similar to the vital interest one you have here, a legitimate interest as well as a legal basis in Brazil. And then we have one that uh, is specifically important to Brazil, which is credit protection. This would probably apply to a, a range of banks, financial institutions, and even credit bureaus in Brazil. So it's a little bit easier for them to process data, especially considering that we actually have a high level of default on payments in Brazil in some cases. So this could be useful for these kinds of companies and controllers. On data subjects rights, we have pretty much the same rights you have under GDPR. So we have the right to confirm the existence of a processing if that occurs. A data subject also has the right of access, the right of rectification of data that might be incomplete, inaccurate, or outdated, uh, the right of anonymizing data or at least blocking or erasing any kind of data that is unnecessary or excessive to the personal, to the processing and the purposes of the processing, we have a right of portability, uh, also a right of erasure of data when it's processed with consent and the data subject requests that consent is revoked. Uh, we have the right of transparency, which translates here in being informed by the entities of whom the controller shared the data with. Uh, and the right of being informed of the possibility of not giving consent and what its consequences have. And then here again, we have the right to consent, to revoke consent, uh, and the right to lodge a complaint. You can lodge a complaint in Brazil either with the DPA, although we don't have one yet. Uh, I'll talk a little bit later about this. But you can also file a claim before any courts. So you have a private right of action in Brazil. Uh, there is no statutory damages, so in Brazil you actually can probably claim uh, either actual damages if you can prove them or moral damages, which in Brazil are like pain and suffering and emotional distress damages and are usually awarded by the courts in some instances, so this is something to actually be careful about. And then you have the right to request the review of decisions taken solely based on the automated uh, processing of personal data. On the international transfer of personal data, we also have a lot of similarities with the GDPR. So you can transfer data internationally when you have another country that is considered adequate by the DPA, or when the controller gives some safeguards, specifically when you have standard contractual clauses or BCRs, binding corporate rules, or even when you have seal certifications and codes of conduct. Uh, it's good to remember that all of those kinds of documents and instruments need to be approved by the DPA, and we don't have a DPA yet, so it'll be hard to right now to transfer data internationally based on these safeguards, but it'll probably happen in the, in the future, at least we hope so. You also can transfer data internationally uh, when it's needed for the international cooperation with bodies of intelligence, investigation, persecution, or according to other international treaties. Uh, when it's necessary for the protection of life of physical well-being. Uh, also, when the DPA authorizes the transfer, which is something interesting. So when we have a DPA, if the DPA actually says, hey, it's okay, you can transfer this kind of data internationally, you can do that as long as they actually conform and ratify those kinds of, of transactions and, and transfers. Uh, you can also transfer data internationally when is the result of a commitment taken in international agreement or when is necessary to comply and execute public policies. 
uh, with consent, which is the same under the GDPR, and when you have to fulfill either a legal or regulatory obligation or to fulfill a, a contract or any kind of preliminary procedures. Uh, so right now, I'll probably point <coughs> some differences that we have under the LGPD uh, from the GDPR, which uh, are actually important. So when you are complying with the GDPR, it doesn't actually mean that you are entirely complying with the LGPD. Uh, although we have a lot of similarities between the two laws, and which results that uh, when you are complying with GDPR, you are probably complying with a big part of the law in Brazil, but not entirely with all of it. So regarding the DPOs, according to the LGPD, all controllers need to appoint a DPO. This is an obligation only to controllers, not to processors, but all of kind of controllers need to do that. So either if you have a, a big tech company or a small bakery that only sells bread in your local neighborhood, they both need to appoint a DPO. This might later be reviewed by the Brazilian Data Protection Authority. Uh, actually, the law already says in the states that the DPA can later on just set some requirements and set some kind of waiver uh, for what kind of controllers actually need to appoint a DPO and which ones don't actually need to do that. Now, we don't have a lot of description about the role of the DPO. The law just says that the DPO is, the, is actually the person responsible for handling the communications between the controller, the data subjects, and the DPA. <coughs> Sorry, and it could be either an individual or a legal entity. Uh, regarding DPIAs in Brazil, uh, the LGPD actually does not make mandatory to to perform a DPIA, it says, again, that the DPA, the Data Protection Authority, can request DPIAs from private entities, uh, and it says that in some cases from public entities, it can request that a DPIA is published. But again, there's no actually obligation, or, or it's not mandatory to perform a DPIA. If you are doing already, that's great. You're probably gonna have a lot of records, and this is something really good to comply with the Brazilian law because we also have a record skipping uh, requirement. But at the same time, it's not mandatory that you do that. Uh, and when you probably are doing a DPIA, the minimum content of it, it's described in the law. So you have to describe the types of data you collect, the methods you use to collect data and to guarantee the information security, and you have to provide an evaluation of the controller regarding the measures of the safeguards and the mechanisms to mitigate or even to eliminate the risk. Uh, it, it's probably interesting to say that as we don't have a DPIA being mandatory, we also do not have any kind of prior consultation with the DPA. So even if you are carrying out a DPIA, and you find out that there are, are high risks of, to the fundamental rights of the data subjects, the law does not say anything about having to uh, prior consult the DPA. About sanctions under the Brazilian law, they are a little bit lower than under the GDPR. So the most important one probably, which is the fine, is a fine of up to 2% of the turnover of the private legal entity, the group, or the conglomerate in Brazil. And this is actually limited to 50 million Brazilian reais. So if you think about it, up to 2% and with a, with a cap and a max amount of 50 million, you'd have to be a company with a turnover of 2.5 billion Brazilian reais to actually receive a fine of 50 million. This is probably uh, way lower than what you have under the GDPR, although the percentage is the same for at least one of the infractions that you can get under the GDPR. The amount itself is not that high or, or probably would probably not be that high. It could be, but uh, it, it's not, you have a limit. So at the same time, uh, it, it could be a huge fine, but not the same or not so severe as under GDPR. We also have sanctions related to giving publicity to the infraction after it is confirmed. 
or blocking the personal data related to the infraction or even erasing the personal, personal data related to the infraction. Uh, right now, as I talked before, Congress is discussing the provisional measure 869 and again, uh, the language of the law is being amended if the if the provisional measure is actually converted into law. So we have, again, sanctions that were vetoed at, at first time. So we have sanctions related to the suspension or actually a full prohibition of processing personal data in some cases. This is not in the law yet. It needs to be actually approved by Congress and after that sanctioned by the president. But we could have, again, it's not here on the slides, but we could have, again, some sanctions that uh, could actually do a lot of harm, which is which are suspension or a full prohibition of processing personal data. <coughs> and this is a slide with some of the main difference uh, of the LGPD to the GDPR. Uh, so the first one here, the deadline to respond to data subjects access request and to provide a full report of the data is 15 days. Uh, that is if the request is not something simple and cannot be responded with a simple form because if that's the case you should be answer or it should be answered immediately but if you need more time and you need a time to actually provide a full report on the data to the data subject you have 15 days which is a short period of time uh, the second one the records must be taken by all companies so we don't have any kind of derogations or exceptions even for small companies so you have a derogation under the gdpr for companies with less than 250 employees provided that uh, some conditions are met but we don't have any kind of derogations under the law right now we could have later when the dpa issues some regulations but right now we don't uh, number Three here, in case of a data breach in Brazil, according to the LGPD, uh, the controller shall notify both the data subjects and the DPA when this kind of breach could result in either a relevant damage or risk to the data subject. As we do not have any kind of trash rule held regarding what kind of risk this is, this is probably the same as to say that when you have a data breach, you're probably going to have some kind of risks uh, to the data subjects. And because of that, you probably need to notify both the DPA and the data subjects. Uh, as I said before, the fines are substantially lower. At the same time, uh, it's probably good to mention that we have a lot of litigation in Brazil. So because of the law giving a private right of action uh, to individuals, uh, it might be expected that a lot of data subjects will file claims under the Brazilian court, especially before what is called in Brazil, uh, it's something like the U.S. the small claims court, where data subjects and individuals can actually file a claim without having to pay any uh, court fees or any attorney fees, even if they lose. And because of that, uh, it might be expected that we have an increase in the litigation related to the LGPD as well. As we said before, a DPO must be appointed by every controller, and a DPIA is not mandatory in any case. Uh, and just to talk a little bit about our DPA, we have the provisional measure which has been discussed in Congress is the one that created the DPA. So the DPA right now is already created but is not staffed it's like an empty shell is just waiting there for the provisional measure to be either approved and converted into law or become new and void and if that happens we will not have a dpa anymore this is alarming in a lot of ways uh, especially because a great part of the brazilian law still needs some further regulation so when you have a data breach you need to notify both the data subjects and the dpa and this right now is within a reasonable time that there's no clear guidance of what is a reasonable time so the dpa will probably need when we have a dpa to f give some further guidance of what is a reasonable time when the data subjects and the dpa are expected to receive this kind of notification so i know that uh, there's a lot of things that under the brazilian law are still pending because we are still trying to make this amendment related to the provisional measure but this should be solved uh, in the near future considering that provisional measure must be approved by uh, june 3rd and because of that we probably have 
more clarity about some of the requirements uh, in the future. But I hope this has been useful. If you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, you have my email over there, just drop me a line. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. And in fact, there's a couple of questions which I think I can ask you to do now before we move on. Um, when you were talking about lawful grounds for processing, one of the questions we had in was for employees' data, can you use performance of a contract rather than consent for processing their personal information? Yes, consent is actually really tricky, so we are not advising to use consent for an employment relationship, because if you think about it, it's not really freely given. Yeah, the employee probably doesn't actually have any kind of uh, room to say, hey, I'm not giving consent here. So you can you can use the fulfillment of a contract, which is the employment contract, to process personal data because you need to have some data about uh, the employee. You need to know where he lives, or the bank that they have accounts to actually pay for, for his services, so things like that. So you can use the legal basis of uh, fulfillment of a contract, of an employment contract, and we are actually not advising to use consent. Consent is really tricky in employment relationships. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's that's very GDPR approach as well. Okay, and the other question was, does the data protection officer need to be local or located in Brazil? Now, it doesn't need to be local. There's no requirement saying that it needs to be local. You can have actually a global DPO if you have one. You just need to say that you are appointing the, the global DPO. At the same time, uh, when you think about the, the job of the DPO, which is to make sure that you have a, a clear handling of the data subjects request and you have a clear point of contact of information, sometimes uh, it would be hard when you have like a global DPO that maybe doesn't even talk Portuguese yep. uh, and because of that you can have some kind of issues, but there's no requirement under the law right now that it says it needs to be a local DPO. It could be a global one, it could be the same person or the same entity for all of the group. And then I guess like we see in many other parts of the world, you'd have to have your local champions to get over the language issues and, and being on the ground. Okay, I know there's some other questions coming in, but I'm gonna move on now and ask Naoki to take us through the Japanese law and then we'll have time at the end for, for the remaining questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Naoki Kansa. I'm a partner and the head of the London office of Atsumi Sakai. Uh, thank you for joining today. Uh, today I, I'm going to uh, talk about a brief introduction of the data protection regime in Japan. So, um, so the Personal Information Protection Act, uh, PIPA, of Japan was enacted in 2003, and it was significantly uh, amended and came into full effect on May 13, 2017. The PAPA uh, embodies the eight basic uh, uh, principles under the OECD guidelines on the protection of privacy and the cross uh, transport of frauds of personal data. The, the amended law uh, updated the data protection regime to address the big data, anonymization, data subjects rights, and the data transfers. And also the new regulator, um, uh, Personal Information Protection Commission, uh, uh, it was established on January 1st, January 1st 2016, and responsible for overseeing uh, compliance uh, with the PIPA. Uh, PIPA does uh, not stipulate obligations to notify the uh, Commission or individuals of data losses. However, uh, Commission issued uh, guidelines on handling the data losses, loss guidelines, uh, in uh, February uh, 2017. So the new regimes, uh, especially data loss uh, reporting regimes, are not yet, uh, yet firmly established. So, but the core concept and the principles are, are similar to that of GDPR or other jurisdictions rule. And the data transfer rules are complex, particularly for the cross-border trans uh, cross transfer. 
and uh, the data loss reporting rules are, are kind of vague. Uh, this slide uh, shows the uh, uh, core terms of uh, PIPA. Uh, anonymized information, uh, data subject opts out, uh, personal information, uh, personal information controller, PIC, and uh, sensitive information. Um, the personal information uh, uh, is, uh, is uh, information uh, about the living individual in Japan from which the identity of, of the individual can be ascertained, including uh, identify codes and their physical characteristics. And personal information controller, a PIC, uh, 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 is, uh, uh, is the business operator using a database of personal information for its business. So uh, use of the database of the personal information is covered by the PIPA. The database uh, includes not only uh, uh, electronic, electronic database, but also manual filing system uh, in which uh, uh, information on specific uh, individuals uh, is easily uh, searchable. So the PIPA applies to uh, every PIC in Japan, uh, whether a person or an entity. <coughs> And there is uh, no exemption uh, uh, for holders of small amounts of personal information. There used to be such exemption, but not anymore after the amendment. And no activity is specially permitted or banned, but uh, media journalists, uh, universities, uh, religious groups, or political parties are exempted uh, for, 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 for purposes of journalism, academic, uh, religious, and uh, political activities. And also use of uh, personal information for personal purposes uh, is, is, out, uh, is outside the scope. Uh, and there is uh, no uh, general requirement, uh, registration requirement uh, for PIC, either the PIPA or other uh, related regulations. And the PIPA and the loss uh, guidelines uh, uh, are supplemented by Q&As or commentaries uh, provided by the commissions. And the other ministers and the regulators uh, may also issue uh, sector-specific guidelines. Uh, for example, uh, guidelines in relation to financial, uh, medical, or telecommunication sector are currently issued. And uh, there is a, a separate uh, uh, and a more stringent regime for sec uh, social security numbers uh, called uh, my number under the so-called my number act. The PIPA uh, has a limited uh, extraterritorial application, uh, like GDPR. Uh, offshore PIC, PIC is subject to PIPA regime. Uh, if, they, uh, uh, if they acquire uh, personal information of data subjects in Japan, and uh, for the purpose of, the, of, its, uh, of supplying goods or services to those uh, persons, even if it does not handle any personal information in Japan. And the commission may uh, provide uh, information to a foreign regulate, regulator uh, for their own uh, regulatory enforcement purposes. So here's the uh, obligation of a PIC. Uh, PIC must specify and disclose the purpose of use uh, disclose the uh, data subject's personal information uh, to the data subject. I use personal information only to the extent uh, necessary to achieve the purpose of use within the uh, data subject's content to acquire its uh, sensitive uh, information, keep data accurate and up to date, uh, take appropriate and security measures, uh, supervise staff and uh, uh, contracted uh, data processors, and allow the uh, subject to access and correct their data. And if there is a breach, uh, stop uh, using them. Um, there is uh, no uh, statutory requirements to appoint the data protection officers. 
Uh, however, uh, the appointment of a, of a DPO uh, may be an appropriate uh, security measures and, uh, and, and recommend it under the uh, Commission's uh, guideline. The Commission's guidelines do not, uh, does not, do not, have, uh, do not provide uh, the qualifications, uh, roles or responsibilities of, of the DPO. So uh, data subjects is uh, allowed to request the PIC to provide uh, provide uh, without delay a copy of a retained personal data, and the PIC can uh, refuse disclosure that would cause inj injury, interfere with the PIC business, or violation uh, uh, violate laws uh, prohibiting uh, disclosure. And a data service can uh, also require the PAC to revise, uh, correct, amend, or delete their personal data. And if the uh, personal data is used uh, for for a uh, purpose other than the one originally stated, or it were, if it was uh, acquired by the fraudulent or other unlawful means, uh, the, the subject can request PIC to discontinue the use of their personal data. And the PRC must cease uh, use unless the uh, request is unreasonable or the uh, solution would be a, a costly or would otherwise be difficult. Um, also, the, the subject can enforce its rights to require revision uh, of its uh, uh, personal information by civil action uh, if a request is not complied with. So, uh, regarding the data transfers, uh, uh, the general rules is, is that the data uh, data subjects content subjects to consent is required, unless an exception exception applies. And uh, there is an opt-out mechanism, and the uh, opt-outs have to contain uh, a specific information, and uh, needs to be filed uh, with the commission for their review. Uh, specific consent are uh, always uh, uh, needed for a transfer of uh, sensitive information, uh, such as uh, race, uh, region, medic or medical uh, records, etc., and uh, can't rely on opt-out uh, mechanism. Uh, primary exception is uh, is uh, for for a transfer permitted or required by law. For example, in the case that uh, transfer is necessary to protect person's uh, life, uh, body, or property, and uh, obtaining the consent is difficult. Um, consent is, is not required if a transferee is not a, a third, third party. Uh, for example, uh, a data processor that uh, provides outsourced uh, processing services is, is not a, a third party and the consent is not required. Uh, other example is a joint user, uh, provided that a certain information uh, regarding such joint <coughs> use is, is notified or made easily accessible to the data subject uh, prior to the transfer. Uh, such transfer is uh, typically made uh, to share customer information uh, with a, a group companies. And the, the name of joint user or purpose of use uh, should be a notified data subject in advance. And the party to merger agreement with the PIC is also uh, not the third party. And the trans transfer and the transferee uh, must keep uh, transfer records. Uh, for cross-border transfer, uh, the prior consent of the relevant individual is required, and the uh, consent uh, must be uh, clear, and it covers the transfer to a third party in a specified foreign country. And data subject must be provided uh, with sufficient information to en enable an uh, informed consent. 
but uh, there are two exceptions. Uh, if uh, no, uh, uh, no consent or, or upturn or a transferee is not the third party to be relied on, a uh, transferee it must be in the country on the risk of uh, those <coughs> with adequate data protections issued by the Commission. And the currently, only the EU uh, has the benefit of such an adequacy decision made on uh, January 23rd uh, this, this year. The second exception is applicable uh, uh, where the transferee has established a data protection standard uh, equivalent to the PIPA. According to the Commission guidelines, uh, in, in order for this uh, exception to apply, PIC transfer and the foreign third party transferee uh, may ensure in the contract that the transferee undertakes such uh, protective measures. And if the transferer and the transferee are in the same company group, transferer and the transferee uh, may rely on a common privacy statement or internal policies applicable to the group. So regarding the investigation and sanctions, the Commission has the power to investigate the data compliance and practices, including on-site inspections and the right to require the pro production of documents. Uh, if a PIC fails to comply with the requirements of an investigation, it will be subject to a fine up to 300,000 yen, which is around uh, 2,500 euros. And the Commission will render uh, advice if a violation of PIPA is found. And if PIC does not follow the, the advice, uh, and order, uh, an order may be issued. And the uh, uh, failure to comply with, the, with an order may uh, result in a fine of up to uh, 300,000 yen or a jail sentence of up to uh, six months. And <clears throat> if, uh, the, uh, if current or former uh, uh, director, employee or uh, ma manager of a PLC uh, provides to a third party or steal uh, personal information for the game, uh, they will be imposed on a, a jail sentence of up to one year or a fine of up to uh, five, 500,000 yen, uh, which is about uh, uh, 4,000 euro. So uh, it should, uh, and also P PIC is, is liable in that case. And it should be noted that the Commission has no authority to uh, impose administrative fine. So only the criminal fine uh, could be imposed if uh, PIC fails to, fails to follow the administrative administrative order is it by the commissions. And as you can see, the, the amount of the fine is uh, relatively uh, low uh, compared to the that of the, uh, the that of that of issued by the, the GDPR. Uh, so what needs to uh, be done uh, by the PAC if a data loss uh, happens? Uh, reporting regime is big, so it's good to uh, have uh, advice by, uh, by council. Uh, PSC needs to decide what action should be taken uh, to, uh, based on the facts of the case. And the Commission's uh, loss guidance states, uh, states it is desirable uh, to report to Commission or investigate the facts and reduce uh, prevent it exemption or uh, recurrence, uh, notify the, the subjects or uh, may make public announcement. <clears throat> so, uh, PS, and also PIC is responsible for reporting uh, losses by data processor uh, it has engaged. <clears throat> So PLC uh, must efforts to promptly notify to the Commission of a breach unless uh, lost data encrypted to specify the standard uh, or lost data uh, retrieved before it's exposed to third parties 
or there's no risk of uh, identification of, or harm, or uh, internal loss only, or leakage is obviously insignificant. And the scope of uh, make efforts and uh, promptly is, is not explained. So it is uh, required to determine, uh, based on the fact, uh, particularly a uh, risk of uh, harm to data subjects. So the best practice is to report unless an exemption applies, and the reports should be uh, submitted online. And the report may be also required to be made to certain sector uh, uh, regulators, uh, such as a financial service agency. And what is the obligation against the data subjects? Uh, PIC promptly either directly notify data subjects or uh, make the facts of the leakage easily available to them. Uh, for example, the post uh, it should be post post it should post the website uh, they visited. And the timing and the method of notice should be evaluated uh, based on the risk of harm to the data subjects. Uh, there's no need to notify uh, if data was encrypted uh, to a specified standard. And uh, it's required to notify in Japanese and uh, other appropriate language if data subjects uh, may not understand Japanese. So what is the sanctions for data losses? Uh, Commission, commission may investigate the background to the loss, the PIC's uh, data management procedures, and the action that the PIC has taken or not taken. But there is no sanction specified for, for failure to report data loss to commission or data subjects. Uh, however, uh, improvement order uh, may be issued by a commission, and uh, if the if if, if the PAC failed to comply with the implement, improvement order, uh, it will, the fine will be imposed. And to date, uh, PAC, uh, which have uh, uh, suffered a data loss, have often voluntarily offered the compensation to affected parties. Uh, compensation payments to data subjects per person have ranged from uh, 500 yen of e-money uh, through gift vouchers of uh, 10,000 yen or to cash payments of uh, uh, 35,000 yen. So uh, that's all my present presentation. Uh, but please feel free to contact me if you have any questions uh, regarding the Japanese data protection issues. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And we have actually got um, quite a number of questions, so we may just go over the hour, but I'm going to turn first to Naoki. The question we've got is, in the PIPA, when you say the PIC must disclose information held by it, do you mean they must be proactive in the disclosure process, differently from the GDPR LGPD, where the subject has the right to ask for this information? Okay. Uh, so. Um, PIC uh, must uh, uh, disclose the, uh, the, 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 the uh, personal information of the data subject if I request it by the data subject. But of course, the, uh, the PIC ha uh, has to uh, disclose the, the purpose of the use in which, advance. Which would be in a privacy notice or privacy yeah, yes, that's right, yes. Okay. Um, also, can you comment on the independence of the Japanese DPA? Independence of Japanese DPA. Mm -hmm. um, so DPA is a commission. Yes. So uh, we're DPA. thinking mm -hmm. about like in the UK, uh, ICO, ICO yeah, is independent yeah. of government. Mm -hmm. How does that work yes, in Japan? Um, I think uh, uh, the Japanese Commission uh, is a, is a, is a, is a relatively independent. Uh, it's a, as I said, it's a newly established. Before that, the, the, the each uh, ministry. Uh, 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 supervised each uh, sector, but now it's a it's an overall uh, uh, regulate, regulatory uh, regulator. Okay, good. 
Next one, again, for you to clarify for employee data, if you have an internal data sharing agreement, do you still need consent? And also, if you store all HR data on a global system where the data is actually on a server in the US, do you need consent? Uh, if if the consent is a, is a, is a, uh, uh, given in the contract, I I, I think it's it, it's usually it's fine. Uh, and also, uh, uh, if the the data is a, is is a stored in the US, uh, it's also fine if if it's if the data service is consent about that. Okay, thank you. And for Felipe, does Brazil have the same provision providing for extratorial application where there is, for example, online monitoring of Brazilian citizens? No, no, we do not, do not have actually, we only have those three scenarios. So this is actually different from the GDPR. We do not have a provision that says that when you are monitoring subjects uh, in Brazil, you need to comply with the law. But if you are by any chance, offering goods or services to data subjects in Brazil, or if you are processing personal data that was collected in Brazil at first, then you need to comply with the law. But monitoring data subjects in Brazil, when you are not offering any kind of goods or services to Brazil, the, we do not have this kind of provision in our law. Okay. And then on one of your slides, I think, Naoki, um, from the question we've got, um, you have said that consent can be specific or through an opt-out. Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate, is the question. Um, okay, so this... Uh, okay. um, so, well... Um, this is... Uh, this means that the... There, there's a two general uh, uh, way to trans transfer the data. One is a consent, and the other is an opt out. And the consent uh, uh, should be uh, specific. And uh, if the uh, if the uh, 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 sensitive the transfer of the sensitive data uh, will need it, will be needed, the consent specific consent. Uh, is always required, and mm -hmm. you cannot uh, uh, rely on the opt-out system. Okay, okay. And then, um, question for me, actually, when you were talking about, um, Felipe, individuals litigating, is there the concept of class actions under Brazilian law? And no, we do not have the concept of class actions under the Brazilian law. Uh, you can have many individuals filing claims together, but you do not have the concept of creating a, a class and certifying a class, and then people can just join this kind of things. Uh, you can have also some kind of claims filed by the public prosecutor's office, which is similar to the state AGs in the US. They are also responsible for enforcing some laws, but we do not have the kind of class action uh, lawsuit in Brazil. Okay. And then finally, if a business is compliant with, say, GDPR in terms of its policies and, and training and so on, how far do you think it would help that company to be already compliant with the Japanese law? Okay, so uh, GDPR uh, uh, is, is a, uh, generally, generally speaking, GDPR is, a, is a more strict than the Japanese regulation, Japanese PIPA. So if you uh, comply with the GDPR, it is high, highly likely that you are also uh, you also comply with the uh, Japanese uh, PIPA. Okay. And how about with the Brazilian law? It goes a long way. It doesn't mean that when you are complying with the GDPR, you are actually complying with the entirety of the LGPD. But a lot of the provisions from the law are similar with which you have under GDPR. So if you are uh, keeping records and, and actually being transparent and accountability. You have privacy notice, internal policies, you are training people. Uh, it goes a long way, but at the same time, we have different time scales for data subject access rights, let's say. 
uh, or even requirements for notifying data breaches. And because of that, uh, even when you are complying with the GDPR, you might not be complying with the LGPD, especially in the implementation uh, tasks you might have along the way. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, that sort of brings me to uh, my final slide, which is when we look at the emerging laws around the world, um, we do seem to be moving in a general direction. And for multinationals where the data protection officer or the compliance officer or legal are trying to trying to achieve a one size fits all. Again, this is not a perfect representation, but what I'm saying here is you've got GDPR and then you've got GDPR style countries and Brazil and Japan and South Africa and so on are, are fall into that category. And then you've got the USA with, with its HIPAA requirements and its COPPA requirements and, and the various sectoral approaches, which is different. And then to a certain extent outside of those, you've got the rest of the world where you might either have laws that are completely different to GDPR um, or, or more bureaucratic. And then there may be absolutely none at all where we're, we, there's no human right, let alone any privacy rights. But that again is probably simplifying it. But I can see for multinationals that have gone through the pain of GDPR, it does seem for many of the emerging laws uh, that it's a good return on investment that can be used uh, to speed up the process of, of global compliance. So that's all from uh, us, from Naoki, Felipe and myself here. Uh, just to say on the 28th of May, we are doing a webinar celebrating just over one year of GDPR with Ankara Consulting and Winnie Chang, who has her law firm in Singapore. And we're asking, are we proactive to improve? And again, we're going to take a review of many of the laws around the world and again how you can build on the GDPR program that you've put in place to get that return on investment. So do take a look at that on our website and book for that if you haven't already. Uh, if you do have individual questions, as I know Naoki and Felipe have said, and indeed for me, please email them in. Uh, from us here, uh, in the room at Bristow's. Uh, thank you for being with us and we look forward to being with you on another occasion. Thanks. Bye-bye.